we are in time, so let's start this, this section. Good morning to, to everyone. We are pleased to start the activities of this third day of our summer school with the conference that will be presented by Professor Berha Kunsch, who on the behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank in advance for having accepted our invitation. I would like uh, now, I, I ask my colleague, Professor Eliezer Barreiro, to be the chair of this section and make the introduction of our speaker. Okay, thank you, Mansur. Uh, good morning for the uh, Brazilian people and good afternoon to our speaker. <laughs> it's nice. So, uh, thank you again for coming uh, to join us in the 27th Summer School on Medicinal Chemistry. It's a great pleasure to receive you here. And I would like also uh, to do a briefly presentation of your career. Professor Wunsch is a full professor of pharmaceutical chemistry and director of the Institute of Pharmaceutical and Medicinal Chemistry at the University of Münster, Germany. He is a pharmacist, graduated in 1983 by School of Pharmacy at uh, the University of Munich. In 1987, he obtained the PhD degree at the University of Munich working under the direction of Professor Friedrich Heiden. Next, he performed the postdoc stage uh, in 1991 at the University of Berlin under supervision of Professor Hans Dieter Hauke. From 1996 to 2002, Professor Walsh was professor at the University of Freiburg. And as I have mentioned before, from 2002, he became professor at pharmaceutical, of pharmaceutical chemistry, sorry, at Munster University in Germany. He was uh, the dean of the Faculty of Chemistry and Pharmacy at this university during 2005 and 2006, was uh, the chairman of the International Congress named Frontiers in Medicinal Chemistry in March 2010. He is a member of the Pharmaceutical Scientific Society and also he is a chairman of the, it, the Pharmaceutical and Medicinal Chemistry section of the German Pharmaceutical Industry Society since 2019. Still since to, 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 uh, 2019, he is a spoke, spoke person, person of the research training group, Chemical Biology of Ion Ch Channels, Chembion, which was created by DFG. Chembion started in October of 2019 and is an international, uh, interdisciplinary project between pharmacy and medical faculty. Among uh, the, the main scientific achievements of Professor uh, Wolf, he is author of more than 300 scientific publications, uh, of course, peer reviewed, with more than 4,000 citations. He, uh, he, he is also author, author of more than 10 patent applications, and uh, he presented more than 113 scientific lectures. He directed uh, 91 completed dissertations and he's, he has now 12 ongoing dissertations. He was director of 23 diploma theses and the main research interests of Professor Walsh are the development of novel ligands for CNS receptor as a class of GCPR central receptors represented by sigma and kappa opioid receptors, glutamate and cannabinoid receptors, and chemokine receptors. Professor Wunsch had done several outstanding, outstanding scientific contributions about, for example, influence of ligand stereochemistry, receptor affinity and selectivity, stereoselective synthesis and chemoenzymatic synthesis, 
and also in the development of positron emission tomography, PET, tracers for imaging of receptors and IO channels. That will be the subject of his talk today in the closing conference of uh, the 27th Summer School of Medicinal Chemistry. His talk will be titled The Development of Fating for the Label PET Tracers for Imaging of Sigma-1 Receptor in the Brain. Professor Vunch, the virtual floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. You can hear me well? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the very kind in touch, uh, introduction. It's a pleasure and also an honor for me to get the chance to contribute to this conference in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I would be, it would be a pleasure for me to be uh, personally in Rio de Janeiro, but I hope I will get the chance maybe next or a year after next year to come to Rio de Janeiro and escape the rainy and cold weather here in Münster for at least some days. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Well, I, today I will talk about sigma-1 receptors, sigma-1 receptors in the brain, which should be imaged by PET tracers. My, my, at the beginning of my talk, I will give a short introduction about the sigma-1 receptor, and then I will show you the development of our fluorinated PET tracers. I will start with the concept, how we came up with the, the, the ligands, the synthesis of the compounds, the stereochemistry, we had to solve some stereochemistry problems, the biotransformation, the radiosynthesis of the ligands, and then the PET studies in vivo, in mice, piglets, and also in human. And at the end, I will, uh, will uh, show you an enhanced selective synthesis we have developed for, uh, yeah, the most promising compound, which is shown here as fluspidine. I will start with the, some general aspects of the sigma-1 receptor. Okay. Um, there is not only one sigma-1 receptor. We know there are two sigma receptor subtypes, which are termed sigma-1 and sigma-2 receptors. These two receptors can be divided or get differentiated by their distribution in the tissue, by their size, by the molecular weight. But very importantly, they can be differentiated by the interaction with dextrorotatory benzomorphanes. The prototypical ligand is plus pentazucine. The dextrorotatory pentazucine has high affinity towards the sigma-1 receptor and very low affinity towards the sigma-2 receptor. What can you do with sigma-1 receptor ligands? The therapeutic potential is depression, neuropathic pain, psychosis, Alzheimer's disease, and cancer. Several antidepressants, which are at the moment on the market, have high affinity to the sigma-1 receptor as well. And it is discussed that the interaction with the sigma-1 receptor contributes to their uh, overall antidepressant activity. In the field of neuropathic pain, there are, is a, at the moment, there is one compound in the clinical phase, in the clinical trial phase three, for the treatment of neuropathic pain. And several tumor cells express or overexpress sigma-1 receptors, and the, the antagonizing of these receptors can lead to anti-tumor effects. Oops. No. No, my screen is no longer working. Sorry. Try to touch the screening and, and then to advance. Sorry? I cannot do anything more. OK. No, OK, it's, oh. now it's working. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry for the problems. I don't understand it. Um, the, the, the gene for the sigma-1 receptor has been cloned from various tissues, brain, liver, placenta, from various species, human, rat, mice, guinea pigs. Um, the sequence on the amino acid level is very similar of these genes. The sigma-1 receptor, the human sigma-1 receptor comprises 223 amino acids. The molecular weight is 25.3 kilodalton. 
The adenovirus receptor is predominantly located in the endoplasmic reticulum close to mitochondria, uh, but it shows no similarity with other mammalian proteins. It has a uh, particular similarity with a yeast enzyme, the sterol delta-8, delta-7 isomerase, a 30% uh, similarity with this yeast enzyme, but the sigma-1 receptor does not show any isomerase activity. On the other hand, some isomerase antagonists, uh, compounds which antagonize the sterol delta-8, delta-7 isomerase, can uh, interact with the sigma-1 receptor. The sigma-1 receptor has been crystallized five years ago by Andy Cruz. Here you see the, the, the literature, Nature, it was published in Nature. In the middle, you'll see the sigma-1 receptor within the membrane. Uh, the, in the crystal, three proteins were uh, gathered together. Uh, the, the, let's say the orange or brown sigma-1 receptor, the green and the blue one. Uh, each uh, sigma-1 receptor has one transmembrane unit. This is shown here in orange and green and blue. A very small extracellular part, around 10 amino acids are extracellularly located, and the predominant part of the sigma-1 receptor is located intracellularly, and here is the binding site for the ligands as well. On the left-hand side, you see the sigma-1 receptor from the intracellular part, the green, the blue, the orange part from this region here, and here you can see the three uh, helices of the three proteins uh, which penetrate the membrane, on the right-hand side, that's the view from outside the, the, the cell. Uh, here we have the, the three helices uh, spanning the membrane, and that are the three proteins inside the cell. Um, hello? OK. I will show you next the, the essay. We are, using, we are using competitive receptor binding studies. In these receptor binding studies, a receptor a ligand and a radio ligand are involved. Um, when the receptor is interacting with the radio ligand, it forms a radio ligand receptor complex, which is shown here. After uh, the, the equilibrium has reached, this receptor ligand complex is filtered off, it's trapped on the membrane, it's collected on the membrane, and the radioactivity of the membrane is measured. If a ligand is also there, the ligand can have a low concentration or a low affinity towards the receptor, then the radio ligand can interact with the receptor, a high amount of the radio ligand receptor complex is formed, and on the filters we have high, let's say 100% radioactivity, in a low concentration. When we increase the, radio, the, the ligand concentration, or when the ligand has a very high affinity towards the receptor, the equilibrium is shifted to the right. We have a large amount of the receptor ligand complex and the radio ligand is left over. The radio ligand will filter it off and on the, mem on, on the filters, we don't see any radioactivity. Let's say 0% radioactivity is found on the filter. And in between, we have this sigmoidal curve, which in, with, with increasing concentration of the ligand, we get this, uh, this sigmoidal curve. And from this curve, we can determine the IC50 value. The IC50 value is the concentration, uh, this value, the concentration of the ligand, which reduces the specific binding of the ligand, uh, of, uh, which reduces the radioactivity by 50%. Uh, from the IC50 value, we calculate the Ka value, that means the inhibition constant, and the Ka value is transformed by the equation of Chang and Prosov, the concentration of the radio ligand and the affinity of the radio ligand towards the receptors taken into account, so that the Ki values, the inhibition constants, can be better compared between different assays. Here you see the two radio ligands we are using tritium labeled plus pentazocene with two tritium atoms in position to the phenolic OH group is used for in the sigma-1 assay, and tritium labeled d 2 is used in the sigma-2 assay. Here you can see the two tritium atoms in the paraposition to the minor or guanidine moiety. Uh, the d 2 this radio ligand, is not selective for the sigma-2 receptors, therefore we have to mask the sigma-1 receptors 
with plus penta to zin, the excess of plus penta to zin, which masks the sigma one receptors, so that the sigma one, two assay becomes selective for sigma two. Um, the idea was to synthesize or come up with a fluorinated PET tracer, which should be used for imaging. Uh, I will give you a quick introduction, uh, introduction to PET. PET is the abbreviation of positron emission tomography. That's an imaging modality that allows molecular in imaging, and now it's very important, in vivo, in a health, healthy or diseased brain, healthy or diseased organism. You can use a PET tracer in vivo without killing the animal. Or, yeah. Why do we want to come up with a PET tracer for the sigma-1 receptor? First of all, for target validation. The idea is to show that a particular drug can occupy the sigma receptor. And that can be shown by a PET tracer, which occupies the sigma receptor and is replaced from the sigma receptor by a particular drug, so that we can associate that in general can be associated the replacement or the interaction of a drug with a particular target and its activity. That will give up, come up with new therapeutic concepts when we can show that the sigma one receptor is a valid target for some diseases. The second aspect is that it's possible to quantify sigma one receptor expression and compare the quantifi quantification or quantity of the sigma one receptor in healthy and disease conditions. And when we can, we can do that, then at the end, the, the, the PET tracer can be a diagnostic tool for various brain diseases. If, for example, it has been shown, uh, can be shown that the sigma one receptor is upregulated in depression, uh, in a disease of depression, then an uh, upregulation of sigma one receptors can indicate somehow that a depression is existing. Um, here you can see the principle of the PET uh, the principle of PET. Um, usually an isotope is used, which has a low ratio between protons and neutrons. That means that the, num uh, the number of uh, neutrons is too low. For, in, for example, for in 18, the stable isotope is through in 19. For in 19 has 10, new 10 neutrons in the, in the nucleus and nine neutrons, sorry, nine protons and 10 neutrons. That's a sti stable isotope. But if one neutron is missing, then we have 18, we have nine protons and nine neutrons. And then one proton is transformed into a neutron. The atomic number is reduced by one, nine is going to eight, and the positron is released. Uh, Fluorine 18 has a half life of 110 minutes, which is very convenient for chemistry because at two hours we can handle this isotope can do some bio biological experiments with fluorine 18. What is the positron doing? The positron is moving around until it meets an electron that, it's, uh, that is its antiparticle. The positron and the electron react with each other in a process, process which is termed annihilation. That means the complete mass of two of both particles is transformed in energy, in this case in gamma beams, gamma radiation. And these gamma beams are uh, moving in opposite direction. We have an angle of exactly 180 degrees. And then we have detector uh, at opposite sides, which detect two gamma beams, two gamma quants at the same time. It's very important to detect two signals at opposite sides, otherwise the signal is not recorded or not uh, determined as a signal. <clears throat> um, I will start with our project. Christoph Meyer and my group started to synthesize spirocyclic sigma-1 receptor ligands of this type. The synthesis is shown here. We start, or Christoph Meyer started with two bromobenzaldehyde acetal. In the first step, the bromine atom was exchanged by a lithium atom with n lithium at minus 78 degrees. The lithium intermediate then reacts with the ketone, with piperidone, with the carbonyl group of piperidone, 
giving a tertiary alcohol. Uh, this tertiary alcohol is a hydroxyacetal. Upon treatment of this hydroxyacetal with acid, we have an intramolecular transacetalization. That means this alcohol replaces methanol from the acetalic position, and this spirocyclic system is formed, this spirocyclic benzopyrene piperidine system. Very high yield. Uh, this compound is obtained in very high yield. This molecule has a very high CD1 receptor affinity. Ki value is 1.1 nanomolar. Um, that is a yeah, yeah, very high affinity. Other compounds of this class are also very high CD1 uh, receptor affinity. Um, that was the starting point for the project when Eva Große Maastrup uh, started to develop a pet tracer. What is necessary to, for a pet tracer? We need high affinity. The compound has high affinity, 1.1 nanomolar. We need high selectivity. This biocyclic compound has a sigma-2 affinity of 1,280 nanomolar. That means a selectivity factor of more than 1,100. That's very good. But we have tested the, comp the, the affinity of the compounds towards 80 other targets, receptors, uh, transporters, some enzymes, also, the herb channel was involved, no affinity to all these uh, additional targets. The compounds should penetrate the blood brain barrier because we would like to image single one receptors in the central nervous system. We have shown that this compound is energetically active in the capsaicin assay, which proves, on it, uh, proves that the compound can penetrate into the central nervous system. For pet tracer, we need high metabolic stability. Otherwise, radio metabolites are formed, which can uh, uh, make the, the, the result not very reliable. Uh, we investigated the metabolis metabolism of this compound and found seven metabolites. Most of these metabolites were formed by uh, transformation of this acetalic system, which is acid labile. And uh, for sure, we need a, uh, a fast radiosynthesis, but this molecule does not contain any fluorine atom. That means we cannot synthesize or cannot come up with a radioligand. And therefore, we decided to replace the methoxy group by a fluoroalkyl side chain that increases the stability, but it increases also the metabolic stability because we don't, no, uh, don't have this acetylic moiety anymore at that position. And we have with different uh, yeah, um, ligands with different alkyl chains, n is one equal one to four. We have uh, tested all these uh, different compounds with different alkyl side chains. The next two slides show you the synthesis of the fluoroethyl derivative, which is shown here, given here. For the synthesis, we start with this spirocyclic benzofurane piperidine, but now in, in the hemiacetal form. Not an OH group is here, not a methoxy group. This group was reacted with this stabilized Wittig reagent. Then a tandem or domino reaction occurred. At first, this hemiacetal reacts or forms an hydroxy aldehyde. The aldehyde reacts with the Wittig reagent to form this alpha beta unsaturated ester. And in the presence of a base, for example, cesium carbonate, the tetri alcohol was added in a micro type reaction to this alpha beta unsaturated ester so that this um, spirocyclic compound is formed with this ester side chain. The ester was reduced with lithium aluminum hydride to form the primary alcohol. And then the primary alcohol was activated with tosuchloride and the tosylate was replaced by fluoride using tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride as fluorinating reagent. That's the synthesis for the fluoroethyl derivative. Now I will go forward to the synthesis of fluoropropyl derivatives. Here we start with the acetalic system and the toxic group at that position, the spirocyclic benzofluorine piperidine. In the presence of a Lewis acid, boron trifluoride ethyrate, the methoxy group was replaced by an allyl group using trimethylsilyl allyl silane. No, sorry, allyl trimethylsilane. The allyl group was introduced at that position. 
hydroboration and subsequent uh, an oxidative workup led to the uh, primary alcohol. And the primary alcohol was um, transformed into the fluoride using dust. Dethylamino sulfur trifluoride was the fluorinating agent in this case. Now we have the fluoropropyl derivative with the benzyl group. But we can also remove the benzyl group, for example, hydrogenolytically using a, a, a phase transfer hydrogenolysis with ammonium uh, uh, formulate in the presence of palladium charcoal. The benzyl group was removed, secondary amine was formed. And now we have a building block, an advanced building block, which allows the introduction of various functional groups by alkylation or reductive alkylation. And we can uh, introduce diverse substituent, uh, substituents at that position. That's a concept we very often follow this strategy, this strategy of late stage diversification, synthesis of a building block which can be modified at the very end of the synthesis. And the next slides show the affinity and the selectivity of these homologous fluoroalkyl derivatives. The starting point is the acetal and methoxy derivative 1.1 nanomolar affinity towards the single one receptor. Fluoromethyl, which has almost the same size as methoxy, uh, has, is even more potent than the Methyl acetal fluoroethyl 0.5 nanomolar subnanomolar affinity 1.4 1.2 nanomolar for fluoropropyl for the fluorobutyl derivatives. That means all these variations lead to very very high sigma one receptor um, ligands with very high sigma one receptor affinity. But all these molecules show also very high selectivity over the sigma two uh, subtype. Uh, here only the selectivity values are given, but 1,300 for the fluoroethyl derivative is the highest selectivity. Therefore, we decided to go forward with the fluoroethyl derivative showing the highest affinity and the highest selectivity over the sigma two subtype. And this compound was termed fluspigine. When you see in the next slide the name fluspigine, then this fluoroethyl derivative is my. Um, fluspidine has a chiral center in the three position of the benzofluorine at that position. And therefore, it was important to separate the enantiomers or to check the biological uh, activity of the enantiomers. Katharina Holle, my group, did this. She separated the precursor, the tosylate, on a chiral HPLC. The R and the S enantiomer were separated, and then they were transformed into the fluoroethyl derivatives, the R and the S enantiomer, with tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride. Both compounds show very high enantiomeric purity. The EE value of the R enantiomer was 99.6%. Here you see the chiral HPLC, the expansion is shown here, and the S enantiomer is a little bit less. The enantiomeric excess, but we are in the range of 96.4% EE. Here you see a small, uh, a small amount of the R enantiomer. The affinity of both compounds is very high. The R enantiomer 0.57 nanomolar and the S enantiomer 2.3 nanomolar, which shows that. The R enantiomer is the eutomer and the S enantiomer is the distomer, but the dysmic ratio is very small, only uh, the, the R enantiomer is only in the range of fourfold more active than the S enantiomer. Therefore, both enantiomers are appropriate to be developed as petrols. Um, what we had to do. Uh, we have only separated R and S enantiomers, but we did not know the absolute configuration. And for this purpose, we recorded CD spectra. Here you see the CD spectrum of the S enantiomer, and here the CD spectrum of the R enantiomer. These two CD spectra are mirror images, and we, to, to uh, analyze the absolute configuration, we recorded the CD spectrum of this molecule that's a model compound, which has less conformational freedom than these molecules. The fluoroethyl group was reduced to a small methyl group. 
And here the CD spectrum for the RNA enantiomer was recorded showing the negative cotton effect at 220 nanometer. And here the RNA enantiomer has also a negative cotton effect at 220 nanometer. And therefore it is clear that the compound with a negative cotton effect has to be R configured and the other enantiomer is the S configured one. Um, very early in our developments, we include metabolism studies. Metabolism studies, uh, here in the, this slide shows a little bit uh, the, the, the um, general procedure we follow. We start with a liver material, rat or mouse liver is used depending on the species which we are interested in. And then the, the liver is, worked up and the microsome preparation is prepared. And this microsome preparation is incubated with the drug. And then we have to add some cofactors, NADPH, to see the metabolites formed from ZIP enzymes, UTPGR, that's the activated glucuronic acid to see uh, phase two metabolites uh, conjugates with glucuronic acid. PUPS, that's the activated sulfate, conjugates with sulfuric acid and SAM, that is s adenosyl methionine, which is required for the methylation. Uh, but usually we start at first with NADPH to see the metabolites formed by ZIP enzymes, then we do an LCMS to see which metabolites are formed and the exact mass or fragmentation in exact mass gives us some hints about the, the structure of the formed metabolites. Um, at first, we start, uh, we investigate the stability over the time, and then we, uh, we, we, we record the amount of parent compound which is left after particular uh, periods of time uh, after incubation, the, the ligands with the, the microsome preparation NADPH. Here you see the stability for the S enantiomer after 90 minutes, 60% are left. For the RNA enantiomer, after 90 minutes, only 38% are left. That means the S enantiomer is more stable than the RNA enantiomer. The RNA enantiomer is the more active one, but the S enantiomer is the enantiomer which is metabolically more stable. If our FIG also investigated the formed metabolites, and she altogether she found uh, eight metabolites. Uh, at first, first of all, this debensylated product, the benzyl group was removed oxidatively uh, by ZIP enzymes. And then she found four metabolites with an additional oxygen atom. One OH group is included into this side chain here. We found the anoxide uh, oxygen OH group in the piperidine ring and this phenol. These two metabolites, the secondary amine and the phenol, are kind of main metabolites and they were uh, synthesized uh, independently so that we could prove unequivocally the structure of these two metabolites. In addition to these five uh, metabolites, she found two, nine, three metabolites with two, oxy two additional oxygen atoms. Here, this anoxide, anoxide has got an additional OH group in the phenyl ring. This a group is an OH group in the piperidine ring has also got a new OH group in the phenyl ring here, and we have a dihydroxyphenyl group. Uh, that are altogether eight metabolites which are formed, but very interestingly, um, this metabolite was only formed from the S enantiomer. All the other metabolites could be detected starting with the R enantiomer as well, but this metabolite was not formed by the R enantiomer. The amount of the different enantiomers is a little bit different in S and R, but the main difference in the metabolism between the enantiomers is this metabolite, which is not formed from the R uh, configured flu speeding. Then we went to the rate of synthesis. In the rate of synthesis, we started with the two tosylates. The tosylates were reacted with potassium fluoride, fluoride 18, in the presence of cryptofix. Cryptofix is a cryptant. It's a similar compound to a crown eater, which complexes the potassium ion. And the complexation of the potassium ion makes the fluoride more nucleophilic, 
like naked fluoride, which uh, leads to the nucleophilic substitution of the tosyl oxy moiety here. The radiochemical yield, in both series is very high, 37%. Total yield, total synthesis time, very short, 60 minutes. That's 50% of the half-life of the fluoride. It's a very good specific activity. It's also very high. My colleagues in Leipzig, they always told me that's a very convenient uh, radio synthesis because it's so reliable, the reproducibility is very high, and the reaction is very fast, and they like this uh, nuclear this, this radio synthesis. It's due to the primary tosylate, which was replaced by the fluoride. Here you see again the analytics to check to control the purity of the radio. The, the radio ligand. In the upper trace, you see a UV trace. Here we have R fluspidine and S fluspidine. Uh, and the, the, that's a model chromatogram which um, is with UV detection. The compounds, the amount of compounds during the radio synthesis is very low. That UV, so that UV detection does not show any ligand. Therefore, we have to go to the radio detector, and in the radio in the radio detector, we see only one signal for the R enantiomer. The S enantiomer is not here. That's the same column uh, once with UV detection, and here the radio detection. And then we went to the animals, and then we had a very uh, surprising result. <clears throat> the first experiment is with mice over the time. The, the S and R fluspidine uh, were, uh, the distribution in the PET study were observed over the time, altogether four hours, 240 minutes. And the S enantiomer, which is shown here, behaves, I would like to say, normal. We have a fast uptake uptake of the S enantiomer and then a constant washout over the time from the brain. But the R enantiomer behaved very different. We had also a fast uptake, but then the concentration of the R enantiomer in the brain yeah, did not show any washout. We have a constant concentration over the time. Um, that is several experiments were done in this field. And then we went to piglets. And here we saw the same effect as fluspidine. Uh, we have a fast uptake and a constant washout over the whole brain. And this line is shown in the cerebellum. Here are fluspidine, are fluspidine, fast uptake, and then no washout. Also for the cerebellum, no washout over the time. Our explanation is that R, the R enzymer, is. Uh, showing a kind of irreversible binding to the sigma-1 receptor, maybe by the high, the very high affinity 0.5 nanomolar, leading to a kind of irreversible binding to the sigma-1 receptor, which uh, yeah, could explain this uh, yeah, no wash out over the time. But this experiment stimulated us not to go forward with the R enantiomer to patients because we don't want to, to uh, accumulate the R enantiomer over the time with patients. We should we should like to see washout and then elimination and renal elimination of the PET tracer of the particular time. The patient should not have the PET tracer uh, until it's the decline. Um, here you see some experiments with as the S enantiomer, a PET image with S fluspidine in piglets, that's a PET image, uh, in this PET image, the region of central nervous system, which are rich in sigma 1 receptors, for example, the cerebellum, are nicely, uh, from nicely the radioactivity. And here it's an autoradiography of mice. Uh, again, the cerebellum, with a, uh, which shows a high density in sigma 1 receptors, is uh, showing the radioactivity. In the lower part, we did a blocking experiment. At first, uh, <clears throat> the, the piglet was treated with S fluspidine. Thalamus was, shows the radioactivity. And then a blocking compound, for example, SA4503 was added and the radioactivity is gone. In this experiment, the blocking compound was ejected uh, five minutes before the radio tracer was given, though that the sigma-1 receptors were occupied by the competing compound 
no, uh, uh, no radioactivity was seen anymore. The next step was to go to patients. We did a lot, uh, several uh, experiments, but uh, we went to a clinical study and a, a preliminary study that was done in the hospital at the University of Leipzig. And here we decided to treat or to uh, yeah, treat major depressant disorder patients with this radio tracer. Uh, the study is not finished so far. So far, 12 unmedicated patients uh, were included in the study and nine healthy controls. These patients were given the PET tracer. And what we could see is that the patients suffering from major, major depression show a higher single one receptor expression than the healthy control patients. Here you see different sectional uh, pl uh, planes across the brain of a patient and a human control. The difference cannot be seen so well in this slide, um, uh, in this slide but if it expanded, you can nicely see that the major depressant patients show a higher radioactivity than healthy control. The difference is in the range 60 to 23 percent, uh, where the, the major depressant disorder patients show higher single one receptor expression. We found also a very nice family history, the, the increased single one receptor density was higher in patients with a, a major depression in the family. Here, some regions of the central nervous system are shown regions which are associated with major depression. In all these regions, you see the red, uh, the red columns are higher than the blue columns. The red columns are coming from the major depressant patients and the blue column, columns on the healthy control. All these particular regions in the central nervous system show a higher sigma-1 receptor density in the depressant patients compared to the healthy control. The next slide shows a different uh, um, analysis of the data. Here, the severity of the depression is correlated with the sigma-1 receptor density. Here on the x-axis, there is the Hamilton depression rating score, the, rating, the Hamilton score 17, that means 70 parameters are recorded by a psychiatrist of the patients, and then uh, they, they come up with a score of 15 for, for a low depression and 25 for a very severe depression. Um, and what we saw is a, a kind of inverse U-shaped relationship that means at the beginning, the sigma receptor is low. In the case, the depression is, is becoming more severe. The density of the sigma receptors is going up, but then the density is again going down when the severity of the depression is even stronger. Um, this is true for several regions of the brain. For example, for the thalamus, we see this, this correlation for the temporal cortex, for the a posterior singular cortex, everywhere we see this uh, inverse U-shaped relationship. The explanation is that at the beginning, we have a neuroadaptive process, a neuroadaptive upregulation of the sigma-1 receptor, which is due, for example, to uh, uh, cell stress on the, for example, in the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, maybe reactive oxygen species are involved due to the stress in the depression patients, the sigma receptor receptors are regulated. But over the time, the system becomes exhaust, exhausted and we have uh, the exhaustion of the compensatory mechanism and the sigma-1 receptor is degraded, degraded by apoptosis or neurodegeneration so that we have in the very severe situation, again, a reduced density of sigma-1 receptors. Um, I have shown you that the s fluspidine is a very interesting compound which can be used for imaging of sigma-1 receptors in the central nervous system of animal pack piglets, but also in humans. And therefore, we decided to develop an enantioselective synthesis of s to yeah, to, to um, come away from this separation of enantiomers. The idea was 
to synthesize such type of alkylidene benzophorines, which will be hydrogenated in the presence of a chiral catalyst. These experiments were done by Paul Bunze in my group. And he at first developed a synthesis for such type of alkylidene uh, benzophorines. In a very short synthesis, only two steps, he started with this bromoiodine benzene, bromoiodobenzene, and did a Zonogashira coupling with this alkyne bearing this orthoester, that propiolic acid orthoester, in the presence of palladium chloride and copper iodide. Copper iodide is necessary for the deprotonation of uh, forming the copper acetylide uh, for the Zonogashira reaction. And a very nice yield. He obtained this phenyl alkyne. And this compound was treated with mv 2 leucine at minus 90 degrees in THF. And directly, this spirocytic molecule was formed. Um, we explain this direct reaction this way that at first, the halogen metal exchange uh, took place. Bromine was replaced by lithium atom. The lithium moiety. It uh, uh, um, attacks the carbon, uh, carbon atom of the ketone, leading to this lithium alkylate. And now the lithium atom can coordinate with one ethoxy group of the autoester here, uh, directing the oxygen, the alkylate, in close proximity to the alkyne, transferring the oxygen to the triple bond and forming directly this benzofurane heterocycle. The lithium atom is here at the beginning. We don't know exactly the end of the synthesis, whether lithium ethanolate is cleaved up, leading, leading to the allene system, which is hydrolyzed, or maybe the hydrolysis from this uh, intermediate is directly leading to this alpha beta unsaturated ester. I've shown you the synthesis of the ester. The next step is the hydrogenation of the double bond. We did it with sodium borohydride in the presence of a chiral catalyst. And to analyze the enantiomeric purity, the ester was directly reduced to the primary alcohol, and the enantiomeric excess of the primary alcohol was recorded. And when we do it in the correct way, we find 97.2% enantiomeric excess. The next slide shows the chiral catalyst, which was used in this system. It is a cobalt, um, uh, cobalt complex of this enantiomeric ligand. In this, uh, in this reaction, uh, sodium borohydride transfers one hydride to the cobalt system here, and the cobalt hydride is uh, transferring the hydride to the double bond of this alpha beta unsaturated ester leading to this high enantiomeric ratio 98 to 6, 98.6 to 1.4 is the ratio of S to R using this chiral catalyst. When we do the, the, the analysis on the stage of the primary alcohol. The last two steps are straightforward, tosylation of the alcohol and substitution of the tosylate with fluoride leads in altogether five steps to the PET tracer, we can use the tosylate for the cold fluorination or for the fluorination with fluorine 18. I will give a short summary of my talk. I have shown you some techniques. I have shown you our competitive radio ligand receptor binding studies. We have shown you the competition between a ligand and the radio ligand, which compete for a limited number of receptors. I have shown you our concept of late stage diversification. We very often follow this strategy for the synthesis of a series of compounds to synthesize a building block and modify at the very end uh, to, in to include or introduce the diversity. I have shown you the structure affinity relationships for the homologous series of fluoroalkyl uh, benzofuranes. Very early in our investigations, we start with biotransformation experiments to see very early the, the metabolically uh, labile positions and can stabilize the molecules in, in a uh, good way. 
And I've shown you at the very end that if a compound is successful, we are very interested in the development of enhanced selective, uh, uh, the development of enhanced selective synthesis uh, to avoid separation of enantiomers. What I have shown you, I have shown you the development of s flusbidine as a PET tracer, which can be used for the imaging of sigma-1 receptors in the brain. The compound has very high affinity, uh, low nanomolar affinity, the s enantiomer 2.3 nanomolar, high selectivity over the sigma-2 subtype, but also over other receptors. It is appropriate as a PET tracer in animals, but also in patients suffering from major depressive disorder. And so far we have shown an upregulation in these patients of the sigma-1 receptor, um, which yeah, will be followed further. The last, the, oh, the la the almost last slide shows the co-workers who were involved in this project. Uh, these five people were all, uh, already shown on my slides. Dirk Schepan, Kirsten Jemko, Basti Freeland, they are responsible for the biological studies in my group. Here are the collaboration partners uh, for CD spectroscopy, the radiochemistry. The clinical study was done by Professor Osama Sabri at the University of Leipzig. And the enhanced selective, for the enhanced selective synthesis, we got an answer, an answer by ligand from Professor Kitamura from Nagoya University. Here you see the funding organizations. I would like to highlight Cambion. Research Training Group, which is funded since 2019 by the German Research Foundation. And the last slide shows my group. Unfortunately, that's not an actual picture of my group. It's almost one year old because we are not allowed to come together anymore and make a new group photo. Therefore, it's a uh, group photo that's uh, a little bit more than one year old. But I would like to highlight this guy here, uh, that's Daniele Silva from Sao Paulo. He spent one year in my group as a postdoc. He was working together with Anna Juncker, did a great job in our lab. Thank you for your kind attention. Okay. Thank you very much for your very, very nice presentation, Professor Bush. And now I ask to the people to send some questions using the chat, or if you prefer, you can use also the microphone. I have a, a question. Yes, please. First, congratulations for the excellent talk. Very complete work. Very nice for us. Thank uh, you. I, I have a, a doubt about the efficacy of uh, fluspidine and the other compounds that you have uh, uh, synthesized. What is the, 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 the intrinsic efficacy of these compounds? What do you mean with efficacy? Um, yes, it, it is agonists, antagonists, or partial agonists of the, the sigma re receptors. We, we have some information about, uh, about this. What, what, what kind of modulation these compounds are able to, to do in, in sigma receptor? Okay. Um, first of all, um, the idea was to do a PET study, come up with a PET uh, tracer. And for the PET tracer, it's not important whether the compound activates or inhibits the, the receptor. Uh, it should, should have a high affinity. Therefore, I was focusing on, the, focusing on the affinity of the interaction with the receptor. That's the important parameter for imaging. You should see it, simply see the, the, the target. When you ask for efficacy, um, in the sigma field, it's very diff difficult to uh, analyze the, the agonistic or antagonistic activity. The best test I, I know so far is the capsaicin assay, where you see whether a compound is, is, uh, has analgesic activity or not. Compounds which an analgesic activity in the capsaicin assay of, of neuropathic pain are, determined, are de described as antagonists. And fluspidine is active in the capsaicin assay it's an antagonist at the sigma-1 receptor, but it's not a very strong one. 
or the, the energetic activity is not very strong, it's not very high. There are other compounds which have uh, similar affinity, which have a higher energetic activity. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Masur. I have uh, just a comment. I would like to, to listen to your opinion about the last reaction that you have shown in the last slide, that coming from the aline intermediate. And I work sometimes with alines in the old times in the second millennium in my PhD last century. And aline is a very nice compound, but you have, you, ha you have here at the left, uh, the right side, in the bottom of the slide, an aline mix uh, in our winter function and also uh, the D Etoxic compound, the, 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 sorry, the detoxy group in the up of the last double bond, cumulated double bond of the aline. And to me, it was a little bit surprising that the Easter alphabet and saturated Easter would form it one, just with one configuration. Have you investigated the reason for that, or you don't uh, became worried about this? Um, maybe I did not get the question correctly. Uh, do you uh, do you asking for the aline intermediate? Yeah, if, if the aline is uh, intermediate for this compound here by hydrolysis, mm -hmm. my question is why the Alpha beta ester has only one configuration in the double bond. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have synthesized several compounds with a proton here and a, a group here. And we always, almost always see a preference for the, the Z isomer that the ester and the oxygen are on the same side. Uh, because the proton here or the large group here interacts with the proton of the benzene group here. Okay. Uh, that's the thermodynamic okay. reason. And due, yeah. to, due to this um, oxygen in this position, the, 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 the configurational stability of the double bond is not so high. Uh, it can, the, 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 uh, the set isomer can be inverted to E and vice versa due to this conjugation over the oxygen atom. And at the end we have, it's our explanation, a thermodynamic equilibrium okay. and the more stable compound, which the, the larger group is opposite to the proton here is formed. Very nice. Okay. I agree fully, completely. But uh, for the aline, uh, I, uh, to be honest, uh, we have, we did some uh, molecular dynamics calculation and my colleague, Professor Wirtwein, that, that the, the energy barrier from this compound to this is very low, therefore it can be formed, but uh, whether it is really formed in the, the flask, I don't know. Uh, that's, therefore I, I put it in brackets. I, I know the, the end product, the alpha, beta, answer to the beast. Okay, okay. Anyway, thank you very much. I, I agree fully, completely fully with you because I was thinking about the thermodynamic contour, yes. Thank you very much. I have some questions here. Let me see. No, I, I've got a question. Can you please. can you hear me? Yes, I yes. can. Identify so, yourself, please. Uh, my name is Bruno. I'm going to turn on the camera. Hi. Oh, thank you. Uh, I can see you as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. It was a brilliant study. I've got one question. Uh, in the beginning of the presentation of the lecture, you said that the sigma-1 receptor receptors, receptors are related to many neurological diseases, right? Mm -hmm. So could it be possible that the diagnosis of the MDD by this tracer could be like confused or used to detect another neurological disease? I hope have, so. you done, have, have you done studies about that or in the past? Oh. The, the first study with a major depression disorder is uh, just ongoing. I showed you only 12, 12 patients have been included. The aim is with 60 patients. The study is not yet finished. And, and uh, that was our first study. But I'm 
um, I'm sure that other neurological disorders will also show, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, it could be uh, worthwhile to, to investigate other neurological disorders uh, for the single one of such expression. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there other questions? I'm not sure whether anybody is saying something. I, I cannot hear anymore. Professor Vinchen, can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you, yeah. So, congratulations for a very nice talk. Uh, uh, I have a question. Which uh, radioisotopes could be used besides uh, fluorine? Um, there are some elements that could be used uh, besides fluorine for these compounds. Uh, usually you can use carbon-11, but oh, yeah. carbon-11 has a half-life of in the range of 20 minutes. Uh, therefore, you have to be very fast for the for the Synthesis and other and afterwards for the for the biological evaluation, the half life of two hours for full and eighteen is more convenient. Um, very often, oh, you can use also uh, oxygen fifteen and nitrogen uh, thirteen for for PET studies, but um, they have very short half half lives in the in the minute region, and if the other. Uh, Isotopes are gallium, gallium 68 is very often used in, with, with a chelator and technetium. Meta stable technetium 99 is also very often used for, for PET studies. Okay. They all decay by, by post transmission. Sorry? Uh, they all decay by post transmission. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Professor Vush, I would like to, to conclude with two comments for the students, because you have uh, presented very nice and different techniques. For example, I am sure uh, the PET uh, strategy or the PET technique is not very well known for all graduate students that could be in the audience, that, will, that means uh, the choice of this kind of work could give, the, give them a very nice idea from the diversity and the utility of uh, this technique. Also, it's not very common in medicinal chemistry to see experience using a CD because the people the, the medicinal chemists usually run up from Hanaway from the chiral compounds, and decorism is uh, difficult to be mentioned in, in usually. And not only the, the, the CD, but also the cotton effect to well define the configuration, the ab absolute configuration of your accountants was a very, very nice and elegant approach. And I think also the metabolic studies, uh, they gave a final uh, compliment, a, a final touch of this uh, conference with very nice points and very important information. And I think we don't know, uh, we don't have any more questions. And before I ask it to Professor Mansour to close the section of this closing conference, 
I would like to, again, to thank you very much for coming. It was a pleasure to assist your very nice talk here today. And in the next time, I hope you will be presently in Rio de Janeiro because uh, you need to, to know Rio after knowing Brazil only São Paulo. And thank you very much for your, your talk today. Masu. Thank you. Uh, before we, we finish this, this section, I would like to look at, to help us with the, the, the book drop. So, before finishing, uh, really like, we would like to take a picture. So, Professor Hunch, if you could stop sharing your screen so all the people can turn on their cameras and we can take a picture together. And while we do this, we're going to do a raffle for a book of medicine of chemistry. Um, how, how can you stop? I oh, can't. In the bottom of the screen, you have the, sh on the top of the screen, you have the stop sharing screen. Ah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So we're going to take a picture out to everybody together. And while we do this, uh, we're going to make a raffle for a book of medicinal chemistry written by the organizers of the summer school. And I'm gonna ask you your help to choose a number. We have a list with the participants and the list starts with the first participant and goes to 111. So I ask you to choose a number between one and 111. And this is gonna be the person awarded the book. Can you do that for me, please? One number from one to 111. Professor Hunch, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So, I would, could you please choose a number from 1 to 111? What? How can I do that? Yes, you just tell me a number from 1 to 111. It's uh, the number of participants of this section. And the number you choose, is, it's going to be the winner of a book of medicinal chemistry that the organizers of the summer school is going to record. So I uh, have to submit the book. I have to respond to No, no. Oh. The, we're we're going to give a book uh, of medical yes. chemistry. But uh, I select like the person. Yes, I'm uh, 27. 27? Okay. Thank you. So, pessoal, o professor Hans escolheu o número 27, que é hum, Priscila Camargo Carvalho, Goes Camargo Gar Carvalho, ela está aí? Se ela tiver, por favor, oh, um alô. So, so, professor, she's the one who won the book, Priscila. Priscila, você pode me dizer de onde você é? Sou da Universidade Estadual de Londrina, no Paraná, orientada pelo professor Fernando Macedo. Ah, legal. Parabéns. Uh, Professor Hunch, thank you very much for choosing the number. Uh, and now I'm going to take a picture of everybody together. Just a moment. Thank you very much, everybody. Parabéns, Priscila, and thank you, Professor Hunt, for a nice presentation. Now, Mansoor. Posso não? Can, can I get the picture as well? Yes, I, I, we can send to you the picture, of course. <laughs> so, Professor Mansoor. So, uh, thank you again, uh, Ben, for the excellent conference. It was a great pleasure to us to receive you here. So, now you can finish this, this section. Uh, people have a, a good lunch.
and I, I invite you to the short courses that you will be done at 5 p.m. Thank you to everyone. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.